Good morning and welcome as always to Niles First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. And welcome this World Communion Sunday where we recognize uh, and, and, and churches throughout the one holy Catholic and apostolic body of Christ join together uh, and join in for this ritual that means so much for so many different people. Maybe during our service today we can figure out what it means for us as disciples where we all have our own unique theology and our own different approaches. We tried to figure it out in Bible study and Sunday school and we got a little closer. We got a little closer. But it is good to have you here today. It is good to be part of this body of Christ. It's good that we can gather, that we can break bread, that we might know each other and that we might know Christ's presence in our lives and in this place. 
We do have just a few announcements before we begin with worship. Of course, today is, um, you can see from the insert in your bulletin, that today is the second opportunity for our reconciliation ministry offering. This is one of the special offerings from the General Church of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in the United States and Canada. This is an opportunity. Uh, for to support uh, and to begin new ministries that work uh, to heal divisions within our nation, that work to um, bring us together as one people. So if this is something that uh, is close to your heart or if you'd like to know more about uh, what the reconciliation offering specifically goes to, I'll be more than happy to, to tell you. Just let me know. Uh, but today will be the last day uh, to participate in that. If you want to uh, do, if you do want to participate in that, just uh, look label your um, check or your, your offering envelope. If you're joining us online, uh, you can uh, participate in that through the normal means or, of course, through Givelify or PayFile. You can just make a memo in the giving that that is for reconciliation offering. Uh, we have reasons to be thankful as we gather together, and we have a, a way to express that thankfulness now. Uh, we've put together a, a, or a thankful tree has been put together that we can participate in. If you came through the main entrance, you'll notice that there is a new tree growing by the doors. Um, there's handprints there. If you want to write something that you are thankful for, something that you feel is a blessing, something that you wish to give praise for, we invite you to fill that out and make sure that that handprint goes on the tree there. Um, something that we can be thankful for that I have uh, failed to mention the past two weeks is that our golf team came in first place. And uh, I've been reminded every week that I need to say this. So uh, is anybody here on our golf team that is present? <laughs> Well, congratulations. I, uh, I've noticed they've done significantly better since I have not been on the golf team. So uh, <laughs> good job, y'all. Good job. Uh, we're also starting one of our uh, small groups this week. Uh, our Weaving Together small group is an updated sewing circle. So if you know how to sew or knit or crochet or uh, do any of those um, skills, we invite you to come and participate. I can knit just a little bit, so I'm relying on you all to be there to help me out. Uh, I've, I've actually been working on a knitting project, my, my uh, niece's baby blanket. I've been working on that. She's now five. So I um, <laughs> need some help in this. I invite invite you all to join in this Thursday at 6 p.m. Uh, we'll join in the parlor. And uh, if you don't know these skills, if you want to know how to sew or knit or crochet or quilt, uh, we invite you to come along and join in. And we have folks with these gifts that will be able to, to help you learn and help me as well. So we invite you to, to join in on this, our weaving together Thursdays at 6. Uh, we also have our Bible study, uh, our study group that continues each Wednesday at 1 p.m. If you're unable to make that particular time or if you're unable to be specifically in the church location, uh, we do this through Zoom. So you can join in uh, online at that time. We also upload it later to our Facebook page. So you can join in this uh, particular study that's looking at our covenant connections, uh, specifically through the preamble of the design of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. If you want to be a part of that, you can join in anytime through our Facebook page or, or you can join us when we have the study. Um, some of the other things that you can find, you'll see in our bulletin. If you're joining us online, you can find our bulletin at uh, firstchristianniles.org. With all these things being said, may we be present with each other, whether we are gathered here or whether we are gathered wherever we might be joining in from, to recognize that there is a fellowship that moves beyond time and place, that we are here together as members of the body of Christ and individually of it. May we be as one people this World Communion Sunday as we recognize that Christ is in our midst. May we hear then that promise of God with us. The feast has been arranged and the place settings prepared, yet there is still much room at the table. Go then and bring in friends and family, for there is an abundance promised for all who gather. Go out further from this place and seek out those destitute, the differently abled, the outcast, the less than, the fringes. Bring them in here, for this is a place of honor. A table where hunger may be sated and thirst slacked. And here at the head of this table with room enough for all sits our Lord, God of hosts, bidding us welcome. 
in our gathering, in our welcoming, may we meet our God who has welcomed us. Amen. May we join together then in an attitude of prayer. First, of silent prayer, bringing forth uh, those situations that lie heavy on our hearts, those individuals in need of healing or reconciliation, as well as our praises. May we bring them forth to our God, who certainly knows what we struggle with, what others are going through, but that in our prayers we might give them feet, that we might move on behalf of our Lord to be healers and reconcilers, those that feed and shelter and visit. I then invite you to hear our morning prayer and to join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. sustaining and providing God. We give you thanks for this feast set before us. We give you praise that you continue to care for us, that you draw us into circles of fellowship that we might not just be cared for, but that we might care for all who cross our paths. We give you thanks for this feast of abundance, for as we gather, we recognize you have given each of us a place of honor at your banquet table. We are unworthy to eat and to dine with you, our God. And yet continuously, you draw us back to yourself. You invite us with open arms and warm welcome, this opportunity to be present with you and to be present with each other. We praise your name, O God of abundance, because here we are fed, not just physically, but spiritually, that we might be strengthened for the journey ahead, for the work that you call us to do, to go forth and bring good news to others in the form of feeding others, of clothing others, of sheltering others. We know that this is the work for us because these are the words that your Son has given us. And yet we recognize that too often we fail. We fall short. We miss the mark of what you would have us do, of the way you would have us engage with this society that it might transform it to look more like your realm, more like the kingdom that your Son has taught us of. Help us then. Call us back to yourself. Welcome us again as we have stepped away, as you welcome all stranger and kin alike, that we might be one in your spirit, that we might have bonds that cannot be broken by the ways that we fall away from you. Bring us together again as one to this place of honor at this table that you have set before us, this table which so many others of faith will join us at this day, a place of welcome, a place of rest, a place of renewal, and a place of challenge that calls us to go forth as we have been fed to feed others. In all these things, might we be those who reconcile, those who invite to this table as we have been invited. May we be those who show grace as your grace is poured out upon us. Might we emulate you, our Lord as we seek to do your work at this table and from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth. Might we do simply what your son has done for us and might we repeat those words that he has given us as we pray to you in one voice, our God, when we say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I invite us then to hear our scripture reading for this morning from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verses 7 through 24. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them, Jesus told them, a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteousness of the righteous. One of the dinner guests on hearing this said to him, Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, Someone gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time for dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I must go out and see it. Please accept my regards. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please accept my regards my regrets. Another said, I have just been married and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. And the slave said, sir, what, ha what you have ordered has been done and still there is room. Then the master said to him, go out into the roads and lanes and compel people to come in so that my house might be filled. For I tell you, none of those who are invited will taste my dinner. May God add a blessing to this and every reading of God's holy word. That might we join together again in an attitude of prayer. God with us. God calling us to, to greater fellowship and community. God of grace. Lord of hosts. We give you thanks that we can be in this place and in your presence. We give you thanks that we might hear your word and that we might be fed spiritually and physically and mentally. In this feeding, in this discernment, in this time of community, might we be bound one to another in covenant with you, our God, with all those gathered in fellowship, with all of creation, and might all that we do and say and think honor that covenant with you, our God, and be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, today's World Communion Sunday, which means we get to have communion today. For disciples, that doesn't seem like too big of a deal. For those of us in the Christian church, disciples of Christ, we have communion every week. But today, we have an opportunity to dwell on it just a little bit more. We have an opportunity to think about its implications beyond what we might every week. And hopefully, I, I, I truly hope, that as we come to the table each week, it is not something that is taken for granted, but is something that is meaningful and powerful. So today we have an opportunity to just think about it a little bit more. Eucharist is the oldest word that we have for this table. It's a word that was used in the first couple decades as Christianity was condensing into a religion. It's a word that was used by house churches as they sought to worship God. It was a word that was originally named after a big old potluck, basically part of worship. Everybody would come together and share food. We see this uh, developed in, in 1 Corinthians when they didn't quit, get it quite right and Paul has to write to him and say, y'all are doing this Eucharist poorly. Because some of them were eating before others came in. Some of them were drinking too much and getting rowdy. And Paul said, this is not what the Eucharist should be. Because Eucharist, the word, it comes from a Greek word, uh, Eucharistia. 
Not too much of a change there. But it means thanksgiving. It means to give thanks. Originally, this was a meal of thanksgiving. And it is thought that it developed from the, the, the patronage system of the ancient world. Uh, it was the social system where there was one person who was affluent, uh, a powerful person in the community that would then take uh, folks under his or her wing to, uh, to take care of them. It was an honor system where those underneath would, would give thanksgiving to their benefactor, uh, their, their patron. This is part of the Thanksgiving meal that probably developed originally from that system of Thanksgiving, this Eucharist. That's not what I think about. And for many of us, this is probably the first time that we've heard of something like this, that the meal developed in this way. But when I think of Eucharist, when I think of Thanksgiving, I can't help but think of the big old Thanksgiving meals I would have as a kid. When I was a little kid, probably up until about early middle school, we would all go over my great aunt Rosemary's house in Girard. Um, she was this wonderful cook, uh, old Italian-American lady, and really put forth so much effort into filling this table. And when we would gather, there would be so many people, people that I hadn't seen since last Thanksgiving. There would be strangers and friends and family. There would be an opportunity to get to know people. Uh, and it was always such an exciting thing, the, 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 the abundance of food that was put forth in this massive gathering uh, where they had this finished basement that was made, I think, specifically for Thanksgiving dinners. It's one of my fondest recollections, and I always remember, I just can't wait to, to sit down with everybody and share. But I knew exactly where I was supposed to sit. I was still at the kids' table. Had I tried to sit with the adults... They would have known just what to tell me. I never tried because I knew better. And I never put it together in this way until I read this scripture this week. And I thought, that's exactly what Jesus is talking about. You got to know your role a little bit. As a kid, had I tried to sit next to my great aunt, no one would have allowed it. They would have moved the chair and just moved me right to the kid table. I've only just recently graduated to the adult table. It's an exciting moment for me. I had to know my place. I had to know where honor was meant to be given. I had to know that others should come before me in this situation. And I want to hold this in tension with the way that we celebrate the Eucharist today. What is the nature of communion? We tried to talk about this in our Sunday school class this morning. We, what we realized is that communion, Eucharist, the Lord's table, means something different to everybody. We all have some similar thoughts. We all have some shared theology. But especially within the disciples of Christ, because we're non-credal, we have no belief statement that says what you need to believe to be a part of us. Instead, what we say is... Use your judgment, study, learn more, be a theologian, and you can figure out your own theology in conversation with the rest of the church. So I have to ask you to think about what communion means to you. Consider what the table does for us as people of faith. And there's all kinds of questions that we can ask. Is it a sacrament or is it an ordinance? Is God differently here present in a way that God is not present in other places? Or is God everywhere? God is here in the same way that God is in all places. Each of those claiming a position says something about your theology. And it also says a lot about who should be welcome to the table, who can participate. Can little kids who have not yet made a decision or understand the significance of the table, should they be allowed? Should non-believers be allowed? Should the cantankerous dividers of the church be allowed? Should everyone be allowed? It's a good question, and I don't want to open it up quite right now because I know you all want to keep me to about 10 minutes of, of, of sermon time. So just consider this and think about it. But what you think about the nature of the table, what you think about the bread and the juice, whether it's uh, literally the body and blood of Christ, whether it's transubstantiated or consubstantiated, or whether it's a memorial meal, or whether you don't know what I'm talking about whatsoever right now, it says something just a little bit about your theology. If you don't know what I'm talking about, come to Bible study. 
come to Sunday school. We can talk about it more. Things like this really excite me. We invite you to this. Uh, what we can say, and I don't want to talk about my theology, because uh, the beauty of our movement is that we recognize and celebrate diversity of thought, diversity of individual. So what I believe in this moment doesn't matter as much as what we believe together and that we can celebrate that we think different things and can still come to this table and break bread together. In a world that is so uh, divided over every single thing that can divide us, uh, communion is an opportunity for radical hospitality. It is an opportunity, like we've been talking about for the past few weeks, to welcome the stranger, to practice as opposed uh, to, um, well, to, to practice philozenia as opposed to xenophobia. If xenophobia is fear of the stranger, what we as people of faith are called to is to welcome the stranger, philozenia, to bring in those that would not normally be welcome and to welcome them in a way that is radically hospitable in parallel to the way that Christ has welcomed us, though we might have been outcast and undeserving. So what we can say about what this table means for us definitively as a gathered people? Well, we can say a little bit about what the disciples of Christ do say about the table. Uh, we don't have a faith statement. Like I said, we're non-credal, but we do have something that approaches a faith statement. It's uh, the preamble to the design of the Christian church of disciples of Christ. It sounds a lot like a faith state. It sounds a lot like a creed, uh, but it's not something that you have to follow to be a part. So what it says about communion, it says, in the communion of the Holy Spirit, we are joined together in discipleship and in obedience to Christ. At the table of the Lord, we celebrate with thanksgiving the saving acts and presence of Christ. And I love the way that this is written because it says something about the table without angering anybody. It's vague enough that we can all go, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. We can be a part of this. And that's what I think disciples are really good at. We're not working to divide or to say that this is the right way and the only way. What we're saying is you are welcome here. This is an opportunity for hospitality. We are joined together in discipleship at the table of the Lord, at this Eucharist, at this opportunity for Thanksgiving. We celebrate with Thanksgiving with each other that there is an abundance here that there is more than we need, that it's a table that moves beyond physical location, that this is a table that has been in every church for the past two millennia and will be in many other places and many other times. We gather at this table with everyone of faith that has come before. We gather at this table to share the abundance that Christ has poured out upon this world. At this table, whether it's a remembrance meal or whether God is present here in a unique way, whichever, whichever way you approach it, know that what is happening at this table is practice for the realm of God. This is a table of kingdom values. What Christ taught about, that the kingdom comes, what we pray every week in the, in the Lord's Prayer, may your kingdom come, may your will be done. We participate in that kingdom every time we come to the table. Because when we come to the table, we recognize that we are in need of grace and that grace has been provided for us. We recognize that by ourselves, we cannot do what we need to do. It's only in a faithful community where God is present that we can do work beyond ourselves. So when we come together, we don't hold anybody back. The disciples have an open table policy, which means you're welcome here. Now the qualifier before that was that you need to believe, but as we gather, we can talk about belief in a bunch of different ways. So you're welcome here. I have to proclaim here that no one can be held back because this is an opportunity for grace. This is an opportunity to emulate what the kingdom should look like, what Christ taught was coming for this world, that God's peace would be made so apparent that we would all live in harmony with each other, that there would be enough food for us all, that there would be enough rest for each and every one of us, and that we would continue to take care of each other beyond divisions, beyond those things that would normally separate us. We get to practice that and live it out every single week when we come together for communion. We get to say that there is no division amongst us. No matter what you believe, no matter where you come from, no matter where you're going, 
no matter your ethnicity or, or your identity, no matter, no matter, no matter, this is a place for you. And not only is there a place for you here, but there is a place of honor for you here. Because within you is a spark of the divine. You have been created by God's hallowed breath. And you are worthy of the dignity of being a creature of God. As such, we can't keep you from this place of grace. We can't keep you from this table of abundance, nor should we. Here you are welcome. And there's always enough room. So much of that parable that Christ preaches is that... When we think we have it, we try and keep others away from it, whatever that might be, power, prestige, wealth. When we think we have more than most, we hang on to it tighter. When we think we have something that others don't or is in high demand, we hold on to it with clenched fists. The table then is a place where there is enough for everyone. And no matter who is invited, there is always more room. It is a place of radical welcome and hospitality. It is a place that looks like the kingdom of God. So when you come to this table, no matter what you think happens here, know that you are welcome. Know that it's a place where we can forget the role of everyone else. For we know that there is no Jew or Greek, slave or free. We are all one in Christ's body. Know that this is a place of community where we all have equal footing with each other because we are all created by God and worthy of that dignity and honor. Know that this is a place of honor for you. That no matter how you are treated in the outside world here, you are welcome and known to be worthy as God has welcomed you and each and every one of us. So I invite you. It's not my invitation, but I invite you as I have been invited, as all are invited, to be a part of this one body of Christ, to share bread that you know will not run out, to share a cup that is overflowing, and in partaking of these elements, know that you are part of the community of God. Despite your other allegiances, despite your other identities, you are part of the one body and individually members. Know that here you have a place of honor. Amen. Here we have the opportunity to be one in a way that we can't fully comprehend. What brings us together, what forms us into one body, is the mystic presence of Christ. And whether Christ is in all places and all times, or whether Christ is here in a unique way, that's up to you and your theology. But what we know is that when we gather, we are made to be one. We recognize and remember that we are one people. So set aside your divisions. If you got a grudge, put it away. If there's something separating you from the rest of the body of Christ, set it down in front of the table. For here we are one. Let me hand on to you the way that it has been handed on to me, the way that it has been passed down for millennia, that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, still he invited friends and family to his table and welcomed them and gave them places of honor. And he took a loaf of bread and after having blessed it, he broke it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Whenever you eat it, eat in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took a cup. And after having blessed it, said, This is the cup of the new covenant shed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, drink in remembrance of me. For as often as we have an opportunity to share bread and grape juice or wine or maybe a little single grape that you have with you today, which is really just self-contained grape juice, whatever it is that you have, whatever it is that you have brought with you if you join us online, whatever it is that you found in the fridge, it is part of what is set forth at this table. And every time we join together, we recognize that we are part of a covenant with each other and with our God. We will live this out, and we will proclaim it until Christ comes again. Amen. So I invite you to take that piece of bread 
and to partake as Christ's body broken for you. And to take that juice and to share as Christ's blood shed for you. O Lord God, Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for your grace that through your Son, Jesus Christ, you established this supper in which we eat his body and drink his blood. By your Holy Spirit, help us to use this gift worthily, to confess and forsake our sins, to confidently believe that we are forgiven through Christ, and to grow in faith and love day by day until we come at last to the joy of eternal salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us all together for another week of worship in a place where we can feel safe and loved and valued and cared for and protected. Where we can share our talents and our gifts so that we may continue to bring a light within our congregation and to worship together in a place where we can feel safe. May we join together in our closing hymn in remembrance of me. benediction. Here we have met our gracious host. Here we have been fed and strengthened. The supper has ended, but our work has just begun. As you have been welcomed by the Lord of hosts, go forth to welcome and show hospitality to friend and stranger alike. Feed as you have been fed. Welcome as you have been welcomed. In the name of Christ our Lord, go and be a blessing to all whom you encounter. Amen. Amen.